I want to first start by saying thank you for inviting me to this incredible um, occasion. And I feel very inspired. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci is someone who I have looked up to, as well as Rita Levi Montalcini. I think that uh, Dr. Pisano's talk was enlightening and very much on point. Um, also in the theme of da Vinci enlightening us all. You know, as an ophthalmologist, I, I went into the field because the eyes are truly the vision to the soul and the vision to all disease. I was drawn to it because of the beauty of the eye and what we can discover and things that we could also intervene. You know, the eye lends itself to um, discovery and to clinical trials. We have our own sort of uh, match between the two eyes when we need to develop, uh, give a pharmaceutical drug. But um, uh, I can tell you that now with keeping in the theme of what ophthalmology and how it's changed even during the pandemic, as the ambassador mentioned earlier, you know, the pandemic has really accelerated medicine and specifically ophthalmology at a really, it's almost an understatement, the acceleration. It really has gone forward in a, in a, in a lightning pace. And just sort of a few examples at our academic institution, um, the modified messenger RNA uh, led the groundwork for the COVID vaccine, which uh, with that technology, we have seen over the past couple of years really um, a global um, renaissance, once again, Leonardo da Vinci. Because with this technology, both for the eye and the body, we are continuing to uh, bring forth science. This technology is now being used in cancer. It's being used in um, heart disease. It's being used to help people with uh, various uh, food allergies and environmental allergies. Uh, the pandemic and this world has really catapulted us into a world of now virtual reality. And in my practice now for telemedicine um, and uh, hybrid-based learning, which we continue to use. So um, there are many themes uh, from today, and I can tell you as an academic ophthalmologist, I'm excited to be here and share some of the insights that I have learned from the science and also neurotrophins and drugs, which we, which we can talk about, and I'm sure other members of the panel, I can tell you my experience as a clinical um, a researcher and uh, running clinical trials as a principal investigator. I've had a, a very nice journey, which I will uh, expand upon shortly. Thank you, Mina. Um, Gary Pisano mentioned this, but uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci were, I mean, centuries ago, centuries before, was on it. I mean, uh, Gary was uh, touching on how uh, we're not all the same. I mean, we're humans, yes, but every human has an immunology profile which is different. Again, da Vinci understood that, and he spoke about the feminine in, in, uh, in women. Dan Brown made a great book out of it. Sabra, you are really working in this, uh, uh, on this issue, and uh, uh, what does it tell us about innovation, and how do we bring medicine further? How do we bring uh, better cures to patients? Oh, thank you for that question. And so, yes, as a, as a basic scientist in biomedical research, I was always struck by how clinical trials often weren't enrolling uh, women at the same rate as men. And this dates back many decades, um, at least in the United States, back to 1977 when the FDA recommended exclusion of women of reproductive ages from clinical trials. And this was in part because of concerns about the toxic effects of drugs on, on a pregnant woman and her developing fetus. This then got just misconstrued in which all women, regardless of age, regardless of reproductive status, and, and regardless of their ability to make autonomous decisions about participation, were excluded. And it really wasn't until 1993 that Congresswomen being made aware um, that many of the drugs that they were taking for their heart, drugs in lots of clinical trials, had really been based on data from men. And so I think we even heard that in, in the remarks um, just moments ago that Moderna was thinking about, well, who was excluded? And, and still pregnant women are excluded, though many of these drugs are not contraindicated and they're being asked to take these drugs after FDA approval, and it contributes to some of the lack of trust. And so finding ways to address some of the biology that underlies the differences so that we can um, ensure equity 
in the efficacy of drugs and biologics is a part of what I aim to do. Thank you. That's uh, uh, very promising and uh, very uh, very needed, I, I would say. Uh, Andy, I think you your work sort of I know you two collaborate on 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 in very re various research projects, but um, you take at this from another side from uh, the more pathology side, the, the molecular biology side, what do you see from your point of observation? Because you're, you're really one of the guys with uh, the new eyes, those uh, uh, eyes for genes and, and the, the invisible to man, basically. Yeah, you know, one of the things I think that we've shown during the pandemic is the amazing ability to generate data, generate data at a large scale and analyze that data. Um, I think a shortcoming that has, uh, has come from that is our ability to do that quickly in a way that will make a difference for an individual that's showing up at an emergency room, for instance, with early symptoms of a respiratory illness. And so one of the things that we're really now focusing on is how do we do things at a faster timeline? How do we do things at the site of diagnosis to try to give us a head start to try to predict if an individual is going to be more likely to develop severe disease because we know that the earlier we intervene in an infectious disease, the more likely the outcome will be beneficial. If we wait too long, there's oftentimes very little that medicine can do except try to treat symptoms and hold things out. And so a place where I think it's going to be incredibly important to have that business academic collaboration is to really try to take some of the assays that for instance, Sabra and I do, that oftentimes take days or weeks to complete and try to miniaturize them, speed them up, put them in the places where the patients are coming in so that we can generate data in close to real time and analyze that data close to real time on an individual basis. And I think that's going to take a lot of challenge that brings expertise that I think business is perfectly suited to try to apply that to. Um, we're generating the science, we're looking for the markers that might help predict that, finding a way to do that fast so that it can impact an individual's treatment is really, I think, the next challenge that we're facing. Thank you, Andy. Um, there's, there's sort of a pattern here. There's something you're all saying between the lines, and that's basically that uh, uh, you work in one field, but then uh, there's a, a transdisciplinary effect uh, and uh, what I like about this is uh, uh, is what you're doing Flavio because uh, um, I mean you were uh, working with uh, um, the, the Rita Levi Montalcini group and uh, uh, Leonardo said w the eyes window to the soul but uh, she was saying that uh, um, her research her, her uh, NGF was a window to the brain in fact so and and then you applied it to uh, to eye research. So how is there like sort of a, does it go for a circle? Are there more applications? Yeah, actually it does. And uh, I think that's a statement I love, you know, the eye being a window to the brain. So doing reverse engineering and, and uh, matching uh, the statements by these two Italian geniuses, uh, Da Vinci and Ritalevi Montalcini, uh, what uh, she discovered, the first neurotrophin, was actually something that was discovered uh, as a molecule that is capable to drive the growth of neurons. So there was enormous expectation about the possibility to use uh, this neurotrophin in brain disease. It's been tested in the past, but it's beautiful how at the end uh, uh, it's through an application on ophthalmic disease that for the first time this neurotrophin has seen uh, a therapeutic application and uh, turned uh, into a real benefit for patients. So this was a, a, a very important milestones. Uh, I think it's paving the way for the next step of the research that Rita Levi Montalcini started uh, 60 years ago. So uh, I think uh, the difference from when uh, she discovered the first neurotrophin to today when we have this amazing tool like Excalate, artificial intelligence, uh, and we can apply these uh, amazing tools to science is that uh, innovation took uh, a lot of time you know, from the discovery of Ritalevi Montalcini to the first therapeutic application of uh, uh, the first neurotrophin, it was decades of research. I think, hopefully, with the advent of artificial intelligence that can support brilliant scientists like Ritalevi Montalcini in the future, we will have the possibility 
to treat and help so many more patients that uh, I think we who are involved in pharma, we who are involved in science today are living such an exciting time and I can't wait to see the next application for neurotrophins for sure because that's my job, but also the other things all scientists and all pharma around the world is going to do in the next years. Um, I, want to, I should mention that uh, uh, among the more than uh, 100 people that are following online on the streaming, there are several uh, Rita Levi Montoncini fellows, uh, recipients, uh, and uh, some are present here also, uh, and I hope you'll get a chance to meet them. Feel no pressure, guys. I, we expect not, nothing less than a noble from you, so no pressure. Uh, back to, to us. Uh, um, Marcello, I think uh, uh, there's one point that, um, um, there are several points that Gary Pisano mentioned uh, about uh, uh, networks of collaboration. Uh, you're, uh, you've been working on networking and I think uh, the, your research shows uh, that how important those networks are. Uh, if you picked up, if you registered, you should have a, a, a little book, a red and white book, uh, on Escalate for Cov, uh, which was a great uh, uh, public-private partnership uh, we coordinated in, uh, in 2020, 2021, and I think that's a great example of what can be done. But Gary was saying there will be tensions, it, will be, it won't be easy. How do you navigate that? Yes, <clears throat> for sure the, the speech by Gary was uh, inspiring and also very interesting, so it's obviously very important to try to figure out how the future will be. So for sure that I see tension, but I like the, the concept and definition we had in, the, in our presentation, the pragmatic visionary. So it, it's always a matter of the ability to combine vision and, uh, and pragmatism. So I think that what uh, we are doing, so when talking with Leonardo, we talk about intuition, uh, Rita Levi Montalcini, intuition. Obviously there is a need to make the intuition match with the ability to transform. And this is about technology, this is about uh, innovation. And, and I think that along these last few years, we have been experiencing such a fast acceleration in science and technology that we have an opportunity to transform open innovation. Open innovation, when it was created and was a, a was a, the definition of one model. It was an alternative model that could have been run in parallel with the internal innovation model. I think that now no one anymore is talking about one model. It's the model. So what the, the discussion here is how to make this work, not if the, it is a, a one model, poss possible model. So, and this is what Gary is saying to us. So this is the model and this will change the way of interacting between many, many players. My observation from at least my perspective is that 20 years ago, the model described the way to solve a topic. So the topic com comes from the strategy and uh, multiple players with different competencies can play to solve the topic. Now what is changing is that the challenge comes from the interaction. So we do not know yet which the strategy can be, but there is not only open innovation to solve something that we know, but the ability to embrace challenges that we don't know at the beginning. This is an example of what we are doing here. So we are putting together vision, estrogen receptor, and Leonardo was putting everything together, and I think we can create something innovative starting from the multicultural world. So this is if you if you read Leonardo, Leonardo in the, it's a, he had an Italian word that was intrapresa, which is really interesting because uh, it means both uh, it translates into modern Italian in both uh, uh, the enterprise or so the the company, the commercial activity, but also the endeavor, so the the, the effort, the challenge that you must face, and, uh, and and it played nicely, of course, with our friends from Confindustria, so uh, in this way, but it plays nicely with um, with all the uh, scientific uh, effort um, we're talking about. Uh, something that sort of 
fell in the background in this in this round of talks was, was uh, talent because uh, uh, it's, we spoke about technology about collaboration but talent is really something we want to foster because uh, I mean Leonardo himself was first and foremost uh, a very talented person and uh, he kept on learning uh, we heard this morning from uh, Monsignor Roca the curator that uh, uh, Leonardo was not very good in science because he didn't have a formal education in, in mathematics, but he, his will to learn brought him to approach the most uh, celebrated uh, mathematicians of the time, and he learned his math. Uh, he, he did uh, some mistakes, but he, he was a student all his life. Mina, how do you work with that? Because you do a lot of training, a lot of education to uh, your younger scientists. So you never stop learning. I'm continuing to learn. And I chose the path of academic medicine in order to continue to learn and to teach what I know. You know. I want my students to become better than I am. I want to elevate them. And I've had amazing mentors. And I just want to, that's very important in science and medicine. But I want to bring one other link here, uh, Rita Levi Montalcini, which I have to say, what, many moons ago when I was applying to medical school, one of the interview questions is, who's a person that you admire in history? I chose her. I said, Rita Levi Montalcini. She's an amazing female scientist who had to overcome many adversities in her road to discovering nerve growth factor. Uh, Sabra, how, how do you work? I mean, you, you promised uh, some more uh, articulate, uh, uh, so a deeper dive in what you're doing. So I would encourage you to, to expand on what you were saying because uh, I guess uh, yeah. there's, what can we expect from uh, what you're researching? So in, in thinking about my role in research as well as in education and mentoring, I think that bringing um, what we do, not just to the scientific community the way we do through publications, but I think one of the comments that has resonated with me during this discussion is communication and how do we communicate our results and the meaning of those results as well as maybe even the limitations of those results to a broader audience. And for me personally, I've been, I've been working and doing this type of research, considering differences between males and females, thinking about pregnancy and, and how the pregnant condition leads to many physiological changes, not just in hormones, um, but in our immune system. It, it's, you know, immunological changes are necessary to support a healthy pregnancy. And I'd been thinking about these things for decades before the pandemic. And, and I think sometimes it does take a pandemic in order to have more people, be it in industry, in government, in academia, take notice of some of the differences that were occurring. We consistently saw, including data out of Italy very early in the first wave of the pandemic, that men were significantly more likely to be placed into intensive care units and to die from COVID-19. And now, many years later, data out of many countries, in addition to Italy, are showing that approximately 60 to 70 percent of long COVID patients are, in fact, women. And so seeing how there is this interest and this interest in the biology, and, and we're brought together on this stage in part through our, our interest and, and love of biology and where that love takes you. And sometimes it takes you, like it took Dompe, into novel areas of uncovering interesting interactions um, with, with factors in cells like estrogen receptors. And so began a, an amazing discussion of trying to talk about and think about all of the ways that viruses interact with, with nuclear receptors, including estrogen receptors. And, and you know, so I'm, I'm just so excited about the prospect of this inner section between academia and industry. Thank you, Sabra. We have still a few more minutes before we open up the floor to questions. But Andy, is this, I mean, a buzzword of just a few years ago was precision medicine. Now, everybody in the media was about precision medicine. But we can't do precision medicine if we don't do this, just what Sabra is saying. Is that right? 
No, absolutely. And, you know, there's a technical aspect of this, which is generating the data faster, as I mentioned before. But there's also the appreciation of all of the other factors that can help to uh, tailor a, a treatment, to understand an outcome, and to be able to sort of translate that into a true actionable item. And I think this is also where, where there's a great opportunity now. We, we started to talk about talent before, right? I think that the trainees that are coming through academics these days, you know, I've been very fortunate that five of my recent trainees have actually taken an industry, in, interest in industry and were able to do fellowships where they were actually able to go out into industry learn from small companies to large companies some of the things that are important to a company and then that come back to the laboratory with a better appreciation of how to take the things that we do in an academic laboratory and maybe translate that what are we looking for here and i think that's a really great area that we have to continue to focus on and emphasize on um, we as academics need to train individuals to do all different types of work, whether it be public health, whether it be clinical work, whether it be industry work, or whether it be academic work. And those interfaces are best served by individuals who have experience and then have that uh, understanding of how those places come together. Thank you, Andy. I would have a thousand questions for all of you, but uh, I think it's, it's uh, just fair to give our audience uh, the mic. Uh, if you have uh, questions, I know the first question is always the icebreaker question is always the hardest one, but please, we have mics in the room that uh, and our, friend, our uh, stewards will bring them to you. Just raise your hand. I think we have one here. So and then we have one in the back after you, okay. Yeah, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, Silvano Coletti, CEO from Kelowna Applied Science. So um, inspired by also the title of, uh, of this uh, event. So um, the question is, uh, what do you think uh, about the challenges and eventually also the bottlenecks in the collaboration between uh, industry and academia? This is a question for our scientists, I guess. <laughs> so for our academic scientists first to answer. I, I think first is it gets back to the issue of understanding strengths of academics and industry. Um, I think publications represent a very important way that academics can show their capabilities, their ideas to industry. I think one of the challenges is the other direction. How do we as academics see things that are going on in industry and understand the capabilities there uh, to maybe help us figure out how our work fits in with, with some of the things that are going on in industry. So, so I think that's a challenge that um, obviously it's complicated because there are things like privilege and, and things that pe people don't want to disclose, but there have to be a better way for us to sort of see what's going on in industry so that we as academics can think about how we might fit into that. Thank you, India. I think we have a, a lady up there. Um, that was very uh, similar to, like my question is like, you talked about analyzing data like in real time, mm -hmm. faster. And I guess my question is, is like, you know, what are some ideas that go along with that? So like, like partnering with diagnostic companies, I'm just trying to think about, you know, what are some ideas that are being thrown out there for that type of collaboration to actually happen today? Yeah, I think partnering with diagnostic companies is a critical thing. One of the examples that we've done recently is we've actually built a small laboratory in our emergency medicine room for the express purpose of trying to bring in small equipment, instruments, things that can be used to generate data in real time um, to help move this forward in terms of speeding up the diagnostic platform. Now, there's a lot of challenges there, right? You need the reliable equipment. You need equipment that doesn't take a huge amount of expertise to run these things. Um, but that doesn't take away from the most important thing, which is accuracy and understanding how the instruments work. So all of that is a really interesting area, I think, that takes a lot of interactions between clinical and academic and business companies to try to understand and tailor need. 
And one thing I just might add, because of some collaborative work that Andy and I do that occurs in, in countries outside of the United States, including low and middle income countries, we're sometimes getting these technologies, um, making them accessible, able to be used in diverse settings, including in the field, I think is another aspect that we often, they create challenges. They do, and also understanding that these machines, they need to be validated, and information that you put in cannot be erroneous, because then you're just gonna propagate uh, messages that are not true. So you really have to partner, uh, validate the information. We're working with a small company out of Israel looking, analyzing the tear film, and I'm, I'm an anterior segment disease specialist. I'm very interested in the tear film, and there is no technology that will look down at the ni nanomolar level. So now it's my job as the sort of clinician scientist to validate the machine and get the correct information out there. Um, so that's just another aspect of how it needs to be done, but done the correct way. Great, thank you. Do you as scientists, uh, I mean, we hear this a lot uh, and the media love this line that uh, the big uh, tech companies, the data companies will be the next uh, uh, health uh, companies. Do you see this as something uh, that is happening that is, I mean, can happen because uh, uh, they're mindset and, and competences are quite different. And uh, some may say also a bit worrying because if we look at how they treat data, I mean, that's not always along the lines of privacy and, and respect of the patient. Yeah, I mean, uh, big da data, um, insurance company information, um, electronic medical records, ki combining all this, you can ask a million questions. And during the pandemic, when a lot of our medical students couldn't get in to see patients, we did a lot of clinical trials, looking at hundreds of records, millions of records that you wouldn't have access to. But you have to know, once again, the right questions to ask. And from that, we were able to glean knowledge on practice trends, uh, clinical trial, cl clinical correlations that we might not have thought about that would then introduce new topics. So we're seeing this, this is the way it's going, but we have to make sure we do this ethically and correctly. Um, uh, but that is for sure the, the direction. And I think, you know, in, in thinking about this kind of next frontier and including how artificial intelligence fits into this, even beyond just thinking about industry academic collaborations, we're gonna start having increased collaborations with engineers, with data scientists, with people who speak a different language and are perceiving the output in different ways than, than myself as a biologist may. And um, you know, in thinking about how we utilize this to observe patterns in data, um, and maybe interpret appropriately and have the appropriate people at the table so that we do not overinterpret certain pieces of data, um, which, which can feed that notion of misinformation and fear. You have 15 seconds for, <laughs> I give you 90 seconds more, please. Thank you. Uh, Giulio Formenti, International Association of Italian Researchers. Um, something that was um, uh, touched upon uh, in the, uh, during the, f the, the talk initially. Uh, it, at the same time, it seems that there is a, you know, a, a, a gap and the, the, the gap is becoming bigger and bigger between the sort of the general public and, and the scientific community. So I'm curious to know what would be your recipe, in the individual recipe, like personalized <laughs> recipe to, to um, reduce this gap if possible. I think one of the ways at a school of public health that we're trying to um, shrink that gap um, that's being formed by the proliferation of misinformation is through increased training of scientists and researchers and public health officials on how to speak and engage with, um, with the public. I think something else that I've seen at, at, a, at a faster rate, uh, I think as a result of the pandemic, were broader discussions about social determinants of health 
and recognizing that our messaging might need to differ depending on the population. I think we heard that a little bit in the discussion about as Moderna slowed down to recognize they weren't really hitting different target diverse populations, but how you get into those populations and message and discuss, it might differ depending on the population. So I think that kind of personalized communication really fits with some of the discussions that we've been having about how to personalize medicine. I'm gonna be a little funny here. Um, scientific information gets out in science journals, but not everybody sort of understands them. Now in this whole social media, I'm a proponent for TikTok videos with correct information to get that information and get correct information to everyone. Social media can be used also to an advantage.